Good afternoon. Today's expert analytical talk session is dedicated to the 10 years of death since of, of uh, Mr. Vitaly Selitsky, once head of the this research think tank analytical club. So uh, this analytical club session will be recorded. The Chatham House rules apply. The guests uh, are not supposed to uh, well, disclose anything heard here. And if you want to drop something that you want to see off the record, uh, please make sure you mention that before you do that. That way we will be able to stop the recording or we will be able to edit, post-edit the recording and the rest of the guests uh, will know that chatter rules, uh, rules specifically forbid them to talk about this uh, post-actum. So if you have an, e an easier time following this in English, please please feel free to select uh, the appropriate language track in the Zoom settings. I know that some speakers will be using English anyway, so this is an encouragement for the Russian speakers or non-English speakers to select the Russian. Whenever you select Russian, you will get Belarusian and Russian original, and you'll get interpretation uh, whenever somebody starts speaking English. Right. And uh, I would encourage you to please mute your microphones so that during the uh, speeches, uh, there's no interference. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Andrew Wilson, Senior Research Fellow, European Council on Foreign Affairs, on Foreign Relations, sorry, author of Belarus, the last dictatorship, last European dictatorship. Hello, Andrew. We have Valeria Kostyvova, who is the editor of the Belarusian Yearbook and Nasha Mnenia, our opinion website. Rigor Stapenia, director of the Chatham House Belarus Initiative, co-founder of Vitaski, Vitaly Sivitsky Fellowship. We have Alena Kuitsko, who is director of the Globsec uh, Policy Institute. Piotr Rutkowski, the director of the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies, BIS. Uh, I would like to pass the floor to Vadim Majeka, who will be moderating moderating today's session. Thank you, Anton. Yes, indeed, all of us are here for this unusual occasion for an expert analytical club. Because right now we're discussing not some events of today, albeit some something meaningful. We are commemorating something that happened literally 10 years ago. So tomorrow, uh, it will be 10 years since Vitaly Sirisky passed away, June the, June the 11th. So right now, we have the He's a renowned political scientist, the first uh, director of the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, so we're all, we all have a very important mission ahead of us to always commemorate and cherish the heritage that Vitaly left behind for us uh, to respect. And we need to remember that legacy and not in the moments on, of some round dates and anniversaries, but it's also we should keep this in mind whenever there are tough times in Belarus and Vitaly loved Belarus a lot. We need to keep that legacy in mind. We need to uh, also keep in mind his political, social heritage. So collective uh, in national preemptive authoritarianism, these concepts are well known. And apart from, from, from this expert analytical format today, it will be also a good occasion for all of us, uh, especially those who know, especially those uh, who, who, who knew uh, Vitaly. In the registration emails, uh, people did mention that they uh, came across this person during various events. So we'll be able to give the floor to microphone. We'll be able to give the mic to whoever wishes to remember Vitaly, to 
share the experience of interacting with him. Just for the interactive bit of the discussion, and I would like to guide our discussion into two directions. Well, first of all, it's uh, namely the heritage, the legacy that uh, Vitaly Selitsky left behind. Because as we know, the ideas outlive uh, persons who generated them. And so it, it's uh, worthwhile to recall, to keep these ideas in mind, to refresh them every now and then, every now and then. And I will also ask our keynote speakers to say or to tell how to apply the concepts uh, that Vitaly Selitsky came up with, uh, how they extrapolate uh, on today's uh, situation in Belarus. This is a good test uh, for any pol 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 political concept, political science concept, who was right, who was wrong, what, which ideas uh, were correct, which ones uh, turned to be invalid. And we'll be able to look at the heritage uh, that Vitaly Selitsky left behind through today's Belarusian perspective. So I suggest we move according to the agenda. And I would like to, first of all, give the floor to Mr. Andrew Wilson. Anton um, introduced him in detail just before me. This book, uh, Belarus, uh, the last European dictat dictatorship, there's been a second revision of it, a second edition. Now, initially, that book uh, was dedicated uh, to Vitaly Selitsky, so it's important uh, to have the Andrew Wilson to, together with us. Andrew, could you please talk about the role that Vitaly Selitsky played, maybe not just for Belarus, not for Belarus alone, but internationally? in the context of political science as a science as such, uh, your take on his concepts, on his views, and why, why this legacy is important, why this heritage is important. So the floor is yours, sir. Just uh, to remind to everyone, now would be the time to select Russian interpretation, those who want it. Yes, I will speak in, in, in English. Um, so I'll try to do everything that uh, Vadim asked. Um, so thinking about Vitelli's key concepts, when he was writing about preemptive authoritarianism, he was writing in 2006 and preempting color revolution. Local uh, regimes were reasonably successful in that preemption there was no more successful colored revolution after 2006, though I won't get into the debate about whether newer revolutions, revolution of dignity in Ukraine, Velvet Rev Revolution in Armenia, are the same thing. Uh, but in the short term, the cycle was ended. Um, moreover, Belarus played a key part in developing so-called counter-revolutionary technologies. And there's a substantive literature on that now in the works of Robert Horvath and others, which builds on Vitaly's work. Um, because Russia was between elections, uh, election cycles, uh, between 2004 and 2007-8. And ironically, counter-revolutionary technology succeeded in disabled many of disabling many of the key triggers of colored revolution. I say ironically, because the diagnosis of the causes of colored revolution was heavily mythologized, the role of foreign powers and NGOs, etc. cetera. Um, th this was part of the kind of propaganda solution to the problem of colored revolution. But in terms of some of the key nodes and causes, um, fake exit polls, fake election observers, pro-government organizations and demonstrations um, solved some of the problems uh, of how outrage at election fraud, for example, might lead to collective action or about control of public space. And that idea of Vitaly is developed into what's now a quite mature literature of authoritarian learning 
we call it in the West, uh, Thomas Ambrosio and others. So that it's not just democracies that learn from each other, but authoritarian states learn too. But authoritarian learning is lifetime learning, as we say in universities. Um, it's not just a one-off. And I'm sure that Vitaly would be looking now at how the world has changed since um, 2006. And the trouble with political technology or counter-revolutionary te technology is that it thinks everything is political technology. It assumes that oppositions um, work via political technology too. So you can see the Belarusian regime now fixated on the idea of some kind of magic cause, uh, particularly Nechta as a kind of technical trigger of last year's protests. Somehow, it, if they switch the off button, they can therefore remove the original cause uh, of what happened. But this is over-focusing on technology. Nechter was only one of many causes um, of what happened last year. We moved on from the era of coloured revolution to social media revolution, leaderless protest, um, protest in both virtual and physical space. And I'm not sure if the regime understands this, um, which is why it was unable this time to preempt. I don't see many signs of, and this is another literature uh, by Daniel Treisman of, and others of so-called smart authoritarianism. Um, what we have now is very simple, albeit crude and horrible, mass coercion. Uh, even the regime's propaganda and conspiracy theory is crude uh, and imported from the RT model, literally, because the journalists <laughs> are from RT. Uh, and reading the Russian uh, reaction to the Ryanair hijacking, Yes, there was a certain amount of macho admiration for Lukashenko's chutzpah. But there's also a certain amount of criticism of his crudity, that he's some kind of Gopnik president, you know, a Gopnik autocrat. Um, the coercion alone, and particularly on this level, actually narrows your kind of choices. So we have crude now, not smart authoritarianism, retrospective, not preemptive authoritarianism. But definitely Vitality, Vitaly's other idea of the authoritarian international is, is still intact, or rather it's been remade uh, since August 2020. There were problems before that. Uh, and Russia and Belarus in that international face many of the same dilemmas, I think. Russia uh, is also thinking about the balance between so-called smart authoritarianism and cruder coercion. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give up pretending to be a democracy, but um, we're seeing more coercion in the mix of factors in Russia too. But there's also an old-fashioned uh, democratic international, which we should definitely keep an eye on. Um, Russia and Belarus and opposition are trying to learn from each other. Not necessarily successfully, um, the Russian experiment in regular weekend, weekend demonstrations after, uh, after Navalny's arrest only lasted two weeks. But you can also see very similar online methods and tactics. So Navalny's Putin's palace video was a clear inspiration for the Lukashenko gold mine video. So the cycle carries on. Um, we can see both uh, oppositions and regimes learning. And I'm sure Vitaly would be looking at both sides of that coin. Um, but the most interesting word in his work, I think, is preemptive. Uh, and we can definitely say that the regime didn't preempt properly in its own terms. It lost control of the situation in August 2020. 
which is why in, in so many ways it's now overreacting to trying to put the genie back in the bottle. So the failure of preemption is as important in 2020 as its relative success was in 2006. And I'll stop there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, the concept of uh, preventive authoritarianism and authoritarian international, uh, these concepts will be revisited multiple times today. I would like to give the floor to Valeria Kostigova so that she could share some uh, words, share her perspective on the heritage and legacy that uh, Mr. Selitsky left behind, not just uh, from the point of viewpoint of political science, but also socially. So what, what, which are the most relative bits of that today? Uh, it's, it's just your music, Valeria. Right, I wish to greet everyone. I would like to talk about uh, the civil the civic heritage uh, that uh, Mr. Selitsky left behind rather than his scientific legacy because he was prominent and he was influential as a uh, leader of expert community. He was a person with a clearly manifested political standpoint that he did not feel the urge to hide. I mean, it was quite the other way around. He thought it's natural, he thought it's normal for a scientist in our conditions, at least in our conditions, uh, to come forward with their political sympathies and to even share his political advice with political actors. As you know, he was working in political teams, uh, political headquarters, HQs. He was interacting with political parties. He initiated several dialogue platforms uh, between experts and politicians. Uh, I mean, he believed that the knowledge are supposed to work to propel the changes, to bring them, uh, bring them closer. As a civic activist, uh, I would like to note, as a civic activist, uh, he advocated working uh, not with what, with what should be, but with what's there, with the actual things, rather than make believe. I don't think many people would relate to that because the times have changed, and the, the, the times have changed significantly in many ways. But the uh, rules uh, that the political civil society uh, scientific community are using are uh, different now. But back in the day, back in Vitali's day, oftentimes expertise, uh, expert analysis was focusing on uh, what's not there, on what we, what we just don't have, what the discrepancy between uh, what the Belarusian society doesn't have and what the state doesn't have. These ideas, these terms, and actually a large number of works uh, was boiling down to this. This is missing, that is missing, this is lacking, that is lacking. So what? I, I was supposed to sit or sit back and re relax until they, until all that appears? No, he believed it's, it's not uh, the right way. He believed that uh, we should work, or one should work with what's, what's really there, with the actual things, and try to identify the discrepancies between what's there and what's supposed to be. Maybe it's not what's supposed to be that we should be looking at, but maybe we, we should be looking at uh, ways to study that as a phenomenon. This uh, study of social contracts, that is, I would uh, call his key uh, civic and scientific initiatives, that social contracts research uh, was specialized and was uh, conducted in such a way to enable the detection of uh, social groups uh, in 2008, 2009 in Belarus, and not the ones that were listed as uh, well, uh, objects of scope of studies. Bureaucratic categories like pensioners, retired senior citizens, or employed uh, rural area residents, uh, capital city residents, provincial city residents, educated, uneducated. So it was like uh, the categorization that the state bodies apply was before his ideas. Uh, 
Belarus. There were some dilemmas that were typical for Belarus, uh, but uh, they belong to the past rather than the present, uh, let alone the future. Nonetheless, these ideas are still actively propelled uh, by uh, the propaganda, East versus West, capitalism uh, versus socialism, uh, nationalism, pro-Russian trends, and similar constructs that uh, fail to, that completely fail to reflect the present-day Belarusian society or the, the borders of the social strata and social groups between them. The work on social contracts uh, has taken great stride to look for borders uh, of these groups uh, towards different categorization. This is a work in progress. That it was not completed. And we should acknowledge that there, are, uh, there is certain work or there are works uh, moving in that direction. But uh, I don't think there's uh, enough uh, for determining the, the boundaries or the borders of social groups, the imminent ones, so the, the ones, the ones that are really there. And uh, it's particularly memorable for many researchers and experts uh, this wide-scale uh, protest, uh, people taking to the streets. So many of them in in mid 2020. It was a huge surprise because those active groups are poorly picked up by political and pseudo ideological categories. So there's no category or there's no uh, or label you can slap on them, on all of them. And the third area, the third domain of activity of Vitaly Serizky was the expert community proper. I would like to point out that he was one of the few and, and the first one of the first ones that uh, worked in that direction. That natural comp competition is uh, really supposed to be there in expert communities. There's no activity without it. And basically, it enriched the scientific community. It uh, promoted solidarity. It promoted moving towards a joint pool of uh, political capital, or joint pool of political scientists, uh, rather than uh, mutual exclusion. Uh, that is typical for alternative patterns. I believe he succeeded a lot in this. The expert community, along with other uh, civic society, civil society groups, uh, this community is, th is uh, really thriving. And uh, to conclude my statement, I would like to bring back what happened in 2020. In Vitaly, he fell ill and he died almost after the events of December 2010. Those events were not really unexpected. The harshness uh, that the authorities applied was really uh, shocking, but uh, given what happened last year, well, it, it's kind of like comparing herbivorous to carnivorous. It's uh, we, we didn't really expect anything, the cruelty of 21st century in, in Europe. We didn't expect that kind of cruelty to, to face it in mid 2020. What are the structural likelihoods? What are the structural similarities here? Talking about the legacy of Vitaly Sivisky. He was the advocate, he was the proponent for consecutive dialogue, continuous dialogue. He was he was a he advocated dialogue, but he was he was not a romanticist. He wrote and he he he, he told that the dialogue is needed not to reform Lukashenko and his regime, which which are not subject to reform, which they cannot be reformed the way he he saw it. The dialogue was supposed to be there to let uh, uh, the society flex the muscles and, and to grow those muscles. And let the society, let the society, let the let society uh, strive towards uh, well, thrive and oppose the violence, at least mass violence. I would also wish to mention that after 2010, uh, he felt a bit somewhat guilty. Uh, possibly all of us, uh, especially myself, uh, I advocated uh, I advocated the idea of dialogue. Uh, but uh, the current conditions contain no prerequisites for any dialogue whatsoever right now. It's impossible in current conditions. 
And he was, and he thought about uh, the things that were missed. Late 2010 was a bit, okay, came in as a bit of a shock still. And he thought that uh, something we missed. I, I don't, I don't know whether he actually thought that, and whether he would think that a year after those events. But back in the day, uh, he thought that the repressions, the reprisals that happened after the, in the after the October Square in 2010, they were planned. Uh, so schematically, he believed uh, this way. Uh, the authority, the, the government doesn't change, uh, but the society does evolve. So the relations between the authorities and the society also change. At some point, the authorities fail to bring about sufficient resources to contain the development uh, of the society or to make new social contracts with the society. So the reprisals are just a way to balance the situation, to even out the situation, to, to bring it back to some previous state where the government, where the authorities feel uh, resourceful enough, feel strong enough, confident enough. I don't know whether he would, well, it's it's intuition really. So some isolated statements of his, uh, he was really busy with, with, with other things, but uh, this leads me to conclude that he might have thought that. Uh, I don't know whether he would have shared uh, those, uh, these ideas that I voiced right now a year on, in late 2011, well, it's a curious thought, at least to, to consider. I mean, it's uh, well, we can we can consider it these days. That's it for my part. Thank you, thank you, Valeria. Indeed, you've made a correct point. I believe that this uh, gives a lot of thought, a lot of food for thought uh, about the time frames. I mentioned uh, the application of Vitaly's ideas, uh, how they extrapolate uh, to 2020's events, but we will talk about that a bit later on. Rivora Stapenia, uh, uh, co-founder of Vitaly Siriski Fellowship uh, and father of Sonia. Uh, well, right now he acts in the capacity of director it's important that uh, Rigor Stapenia is a co-founder of Vitaly Siriski Fellowship. Right, and he, he dropped this uh, web link in the chat box in Zoom. Uh, Rigor, could you please tell us uh, why you wanted to found a, a, a fellowship named after Vitaly Siriski? That, that means you hold his contribution as important. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to share my opinion. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone present. Well, essentially, my background is somewhat different. Uh, I, ha I haven't met Vitaly personally. I uh, follow him on Facebook. We're just friends virtually on, on Facebook, but I I've never met him personally in person. And I, I don't think I'm really the go-to person to well, bring bring back some memories of, of what he thought, what he believed, what we talked about. Uh, so what's his take on the current situation, if he were alive. But uh, the Vitaly Sidisky Fellowship question, that one I can take. The idea behind this uh, was, uh, well, definitely Vitaly was uh, a monolith, a monolith uh, from the viewpoint of political science, colossal figure. Uh, we can also say that Vitaly is our brand. That word, it's uh, beneficial for us to develop that brand because Vitaly was a person who had uh, a reputation of a renowned researcher. He was a very active researcher at that. And so it's important for us uh, to bring these ideas forward. It's important for us uh, to say that these people exist or existed and, and they, uh, well, people like him uh, should appear in Belarus. We should nurture such persons. 
Now, talking about his uh, heritage, his uh, views, I will reiterate that I'm, I'm possibly uh, not the one to talk about that, but I have read, uh, have read his works. It was a few years ago, in 2021, I maybe wrote, read one book, book of his, uh, the same for the last half year of 2020, only one book. But before we convene today, I looked through the archive, what was there, the, the things published after uh, Vitaly Sidisky passed away. And I came across uh, Rodor Batovsky's article. So it was dedicated to Vitaly Sidisky. I would like to talk about how that, those ideas uh, could develop because Vitaly wrote that article in a different atmosphere or came, came up with these ideas uh, in a different setting, uh, whether they are applicable to 2021 situation, that's uh, up for debate. So basically he advocated the need to work in the country and not abroad, not, not from abroad. He basically advocated uh, well, creating organizations locally in the country rather than abroad or the foreign diaspora he really wasn't a fan of people leaving the country and well, forming a diaspora abroad. Well, we can debate why this diaspora thing happened in the first place, what caused people to move, uh, the growth of those diaspora organizations. Well, I'm not in Belarus right now, so it would be strange if I thought it's uh, abnormal. I think it's natural, I think it's okay. No. As for the thoughts of Vitaly, his concepts are important because the, the discourse, uh, migration in politics, we see the bigger divide in the agenda uh, of, the, of the leaders who are behind, uh, who are abroad, who are somewhere, somewhere else. And I see that, uh, well, different things are happening in the country. This must be publicly discussed. We must never forget what's happening in the country itself. Well, it's easier said than done, of course. However, as an example of that, I believe that the idea is uh, to look at how Belarusians uh, feel, how, what they think about the events in their own country, uh, how they can be worked with like this, this, their take on the sanctions or the uh, attempts to ban the national symbol, the national flag, the approach of the Belarusian society is different uh, from uh, the approach is uh, preached by the opposition leaders abroad. I, I'm not saying that the opposition leaders uh, uh, should be should stop talking about the sanctions or should, should stop uh, putting the national flag on the agenda. But uh, what I'm saying is that the opposition leaders uh, must communicate, must build bridges to communicate with, pe with, the, with the people in the country. What Valeria has said, uh, to work with what's really there and then not with the make-believe stuff that's, that's not, not even there. Oh. The, the united opposition is something Vitaly Siliski has always advocated. Uh, well, the ambitions of politicians uh, should be uh, left behind in favor of consolidation of opposition. And looking at what's happening right now is a, basically a big achievement of his. Uh, the Lewis opposition today is publicly united. If they were dividing right now, I, I, well, I'm, I'm not saying that they will all, they, they should all be using the same font in their communications or they should be walking the walk and talking the same talk and uh, operating off, uh, off of a shared headquarters. But uh, in terms of communication, we see no attacks against uh, one another among the opposition. And we see that reflecting in the social polls, uh, social opinion polls, uh, the unity is still there. If it were not there, yes, this would be adversely 
responded to by the Belarusian society, it would have caused uh, an even deeper depression that exists now. So some cracks are still there. Well, uh, given that, some, some cracks that might go into divide uh, between various structures, between various entity stakeholders. But these cracks are really artificial. I mean, they can be patched up. They can be removed. Uh, but uh, the fact that the unity remains today is it's great. The third thing, NGOs are supposed to participate, to, to, supposed to be engaged in politics. Uh, there are many approaches to that. Somebody must uh, remain as pure experts, I mean, just pure analytical expert stance, to stay independent, as we've talked about in the beginning. And this point, I, I, don't, I don't really, it, it opposes the situation of today. But it did oppose uh, our feelings in 2018, 2019, how we felt about each other, uh, how, how we felt about ourselves. The context between NGOs and political entities were kind of very weak, they're really, really weak. I see that uh, being brought back into the picture. So there is a, a certain reversion to the trend. Uh, to the status ante, uh, what Vitaly used to think about, what he wrote about. I believe that NGOs are supposed to be even more politically active than now. I proceed from the standpoint that uh, this this might be harmful for the, uh, for the NGOs, but it will be very beneficial for Belarus uh, uh, at large. Because in the past year, quite a, quite a lot of people from various sectors emerged in the Belarusian politics. Well, uh, we haven't had, the rank and file Belarusians have not had that kind of political experience uh, that they have gained recently. It's, it's, it's unusual, it's unnatural, but still, that experience has been gained. We also see many people with various approaches to the Belarusian politics. So some people came from the IT sphere. Somebody came from, from the public service, they left the previous post and joined the opposition. Somebody came uh, from the commercial entities, very many activists from there. I believe that the NGOs could play a larger role in the way that they are closer to understanding how public policy should look like. Looking at various actors at, at what they do, oftentimes uh, these actors lack the understanding of what and how should be said. NGOs in that respect do have certain expertise that might be of value to the political forces so that the political forces would look stronger. The next part uh, is uh, inclusion. Uh, the divide between the Russia and, and, and between Russia and the West. I don't think uh, that uh, any of the Belarusian opposition is to, to, supposed to blame, to be blamed uh, for what has happened between Russia and Belarus? Well, Russia and, uh, Russia and Belarus in dialogue are at this stage, and we're, we're, we're in the situation that we ended up in. But the, the trickiest bit, the most challenging part of today, is that it's difficult to talk about uh, the international dialogue. There must be some kind of international dialogue between Russia and the West uh, as, as to the events in Belarus. I see that from my own experience, from other people's experience. These points are very difficult uh, to take in. I mean, very few people believe uh, that any kind of dialogue with Russia is feasible in the first place. On the other hand, any kind of dialogue with Russia is uh, useful for us. It's very much necessary because it's difficult to imagine a situation where our, our political crisis would be resolved positively without, uh, uh, well, basically Russia playing a role in this, playing a role in resolving this crisis. In a couple of minutes, maybe I'm abusing my mic rights, but uh, forgive me that. Uh, he was quite skeptical, Vitaly was quite quite skeptical about democratic changes coming from Russia to Belarus. He, he, he never believed it's possible but uh, the democratic changes in Belarus have come from Belarus. It's, uh, 
it's not like we uh, we believe that somebody else out there will will will, will, will do will, so somebody else from somewhere from some other country will do something for us. We just went ahead and did it ourselves. But uh, this uh, profound skepticism of Italy towards Russia, I believe it's important to not discard it, I, to not discard Russia completely. We should keep in mind that democracy is not really a value for Russia. We should keep that in mind. Russia is not really interested in uh, democracy thriving in Belarus either. But in principle, uh, they can take it for they can accept it for granted. Some format of democracy that would not counter Russian Russian interests. Well, the matter of Russian interests is also a big big point of abstraction. But anyway, I believe it makes sense uh, to keep this profound skepticism that Vitaly wrote about. But at the same time, we should uh, keep in mind that the times have changed, and. Uh, if the Belarusian political forces have been able to find some format of relations, uh, Belarus-Russian relations, if that key is found, then it's quite likely that Russia will not oppose uh, these political forces to be put into power through uh, transparent democratic elections. And the last bit, uh, the development of democracy uh, well, the West is supposed to participate in promoting and advocating democracy in Belarus. I believe this is this is largely what's happening right now. I don't know whether this Western policy is good or bad, but yeah, we see that uh, this uh, uh, engagement by the West is reflecting Vitalis' uh, values. Thank you very much. Thank you, Revor. Uh, yes, unlike other speakers you've mentioned, uh, you haven't had personal in interaction uh, experience uh, with Vitaly. On the other hand, I haven't met Vitaly uh, myself either, although we could have debated, uh, we could have talked about this. Uh, I was quite young uh, at the time of his passing, but one year on, one year he passed away, one year after. The first event of the analytical club that I, well, I, I actually, uh, well, several years after the fact, I actually sat next to him without knowing that it's him uh, when, during one uh, analytical club session. But uh, several years on, I realized uh, we was. So it's it's just. Uh, highlighting the fact that we should accumulate this intellectual uh, heritage, the intellectual legacy. Uh, Alina Kuzko uh, has the floor now. She hasn't just met Vasily, Vitaly Selitsky, she actually interacted with him quite actively. So, Alena, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Vadim. I'm extremely pleased that uh, Revor and Vadim uh, before uh, well, it was my turn to speak. They admitted not knowing Vitaly personally, because when I joined this discussion, I thought that I, I was going to be the only person who never never met him when he was alive. So now you've made my job a bit easier. Right. So I will try to, well, it's all the more interesting. I will try to analyze his ideas. This is an example of postmodernism uh, when the author passed away, but his ideas uh, get uh, pushed forward, get promoted, get developed by the people uh, who value this heritage. Oh, uh, those people who have met uh, uh, Vitaly, uh, please go ahead and say if uh, some of my interpretations are not true or prove not to be true. It so happens uh, that I received uh, two uh, scholarships of Vitaly Selitsky in my life. Maybe I'm th his example, I, I mean, the example of his social heritage. And I'm, uh, I just hope that, uh, well, uh, I will be able to carry this work forward. My standpoints will be revolving around that. I would just like to say a few words about this. We've been talking about the role that Vitaly played for Belarus 
But essentially, his idea is available not just for Belarusians, but also for analysts, for philosophers, for practitioners, for the broader society, um, including those abroad. And I would like to start out by sharing this uh, said uh, observation. Initially, Vadim said, uh, we will try to uh, see whether his ideas uh, proved right or wrong. It's one of those cases when you're making uh, pessimistic uh, forecasts and so you have this dual feeling. You want, to be, you want your forecast to come true, but if it's a pessimistic one and it actually does come true, well, there is a feeling that I, I wish my forecast, I wish my prediction were wrong. I, I believe that, well, I don't know why I keep calling him Vasily all the time, but yeah, he's, um, of course, he's Vitaly. I believe that, uh, uh, well, many of his predictions have come true. He, is, he really saw what we overlooked. Uh, he wrote a lot about uh, the way authoritarian regimes use uh, these pre preventive means, how they uh, basically suppress all the roots, all the signs of democracy. I, and I believe that we have really not been paying enough attention to that. And we've missed that uh, point where intervention could have been possible. It, it would have been easier. What do we think about uh, in these conditions? Andrew at the in the beginning said, uh, Andrew at the outset said that uh, the inability to uh, uh, predict and prevent is, is what, we've what we're seeing today. I would like to elaborate on that thought. What we see right now is when the authoritarian rule is focused on this prevention or preemptive actions and not responding to the actual needs of the society, basically it loses the cohesion, it, it loses the link with the community, with, with the society, it becomes uh, that regime's weak point. And we also see another point in these observations, and it proves uh, that in Belarus uh, there are some limits as to how preemptive the authoritarian regime can, can, can get. Uh, there, are so, oh, there is only so much that the society can take. And those, also there is this point about the international situation he wrote quite a lot about the way uh, how internet, authoritarian uh, regimes of um, various countries can unite. It's almost like proletarians of the world unite. But uh, the, the zeitgeist back then was that uh, the democracies are, were winning when he was writing about this. I don't think that this feeling that the sentiment is around anymore. Uh, there is a uh, sensation that the uh, authoritarian regimes are winning and the democracies should be on the defensive. Andrew mentioned that uh, authoritarian regimes learn from one another, and that's, that's a valid point, I believe. In our practical research, we pay a lot of attention how democracies learn from each other. And so we tend to overlook how authoritarian regimes do that, how they learn from one another. Now, getting back to the international situation, even if we were to admit that uh, Lukashenko has done a lot to promote authoritarianism, uh, there are much more influential figures in this area globally. And what they do, uh, it creates uh, the environment where the means and the politics of uh, Lukashenko can continue for a long time. Vitaly also wrote about the virus uh, that was contained. I mean, he... he, he he was talking about uh, the virus of democracy. I believe that right now we have two viruses, and it's it's not the virus of democracy. The first virus is obviously COVID, and the second virus is the virus of authoritarianism. And this combination, COVID plus ortho, is is a destructive one. It's a very destructive one. Uh, to end on a positive key, I would like to say that uh, globally there is an understanding, there is a profound feeling that the authoritarian regimes have gone much farther than we hoped that they, they would. The, the democracies have become a bit relaxed. And, so, well, the, 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 the uh, mobilization of uh, democratic, democratic countries is, is uh, going to happen. Summit for Democracy being organized in the States, how the countries uh, in Europe and the USA are, are trying to uh, build bridges and promote dialogue between democratic countries, learning from one another. I hope that the next issue of this uh, material will be entitled Democracy Strike Back. 
And I believe that uh, the virus that is going to be uh, beaten is not the virus of democracy, but the, the virus of authoritarianism. Thank you, Alena. I really wish uh, it were the case. I, I really wish uh, what you said uh, would come true. In the optimistic prediction that we started from, yeah, I, I hope that our optimistic predictions will come true and not the pessimistic ones. Last but not least, if we're talking about uh, Vitaly Siliski's uh, heritage and those who carry on, definitely it would have been impossible to, to uh, name our institute, the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies of this. Uh, I'm also a staff member. And I would like to give the floor to the current director of uh, this, uh, Piotr Rutkowski. The floor is yours, sir. Good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. Just a few points uh, to reflect on the relevance of political concepts of Vitaly Selitsky. I would like to share those. Maybe at the, at the outset, uh, there will be some meta-reflection on my part. The question of this nature, whether the concepts of developments, political uh, political developments uh, that we've seen created uh, two or more decades back, are they can they can they be relevant right now? The answer is this. The answer is yes. If those concepts, if those developments uh, uh, really picked up the cause and relation, uh, cause and effect relations uh, between political processes. Uh, Vitaly Selitsky was one of those political scientists uh, who picked up those patterns, those mechanisms, those scenarios very, very, very well. Uh, the mechanisms behind political processes. Of course, political science, uh, well, it, it cannot uh, say, makes uh, make laws uh, set in stone, but some some patterns, yes, it's, it can pick up tendencies. It can pick, it, it can pick, it can pick up patterns. And Vitaly Selitsky, uh, to the extent that the political science allows, he did a very good job uh, of that. Thanks to his intuition, thanks to his uh, rational thinking, but most, mostly thanks to both. Revisiting his works, reading them again and again, I understand much better what happened in 2020 in Belarus last year. Despite the fact that Vitaly wrote about that uh, in, in the notes, uh, in the first uh, half of the 2010s. So the long path to tyranny, postponed freedom. And yeah, it's, I believe that thanks to his works, we can better understand what's happening in 2020, what has happened in 2020. However, I believe it's not enough just to understand what happened last year. It's also important to talk about the future, the possible future that Belarus, uh, that's in store for Belarus. Vitaly Selitsky was writing about the scenario of future developments, of future events, of future trends in Belarus. Without any linkage to any time frames, he didn't put any timelines on that. He didn't say that it's going to happen in three or five or 15 years. He mentioned some trends uh, that were geared towards uh, uh, combating the authoritarian transformation, or the authoritarian rule getting stronger. I would like to share those developments of Vitaly in my interpretation. My version of that, my translation of that, if you will. So his works extrapolated on the events of 2020 in Belarus. If time permits, I will also be able to talk about the scenarios. What Vitaly said about the future of Belarus in those uh, knots that are far away now. However, yeah, what's, what's going what's gonna to happen in the future? Those predictions that he made, what can be possible? What scenarios are possible? The first thing to bring up is Vitaly Siliski paid our attention to the fact that the, there aren't too many opportunities in the authoritarian formal. Uh, there aren't, uh, 
formula, there aren't many opportunities uh, to challenge it. But the elections uh, in the authoritarian regime, those are, those are likely uh, pseudo elections, but they uh, cast some light on the weak points of the authoritarian regime. An important point that he highlighted was the role of the society, the role of the socium. It is believed uh, that uh, the society is scared in the authoritarian setting. Everyone is afraid uh, to challenge the authoritarian rule, and uh, largely this this is the fact that this is this is true. But also Vitali paid our attention to the fact that people uh, rationally behave. There's still some rationality in their behavior in the authoritarian setting. This social conformism. So people agree to live under the uh, totalitarian, uh, uh, under the authoritarian rule. It's not necessarily uh, coming out of some irrational, some animal factors that everyone is scared. Uh, they just believe it. Uh, rational competition. It's all about rational competition. There is support for the regime. We see that the support for the regime is uh, stronger than the support for the alternatives. In this case, the rational calculation works out. Well, people think that way. Uh, does it make sense for me? Will it be worthwhile for me to engage into something that's losing? Uh, Vitaly cited, if 10% of the, of the people support the opposition, 35% uh, support Lukashenko, that means that out of 10 people, well, out of 10 average Belarusians, three or four support the regime, one supports the opposition, and uh, five or six that remain are either indifferent, they don't care, or they are, say, in two minds, they, they, they don't see a viable alternative. And this is 75% of people uh, who believe that Lukashenko will be the president and the next president will be elected one. Well, they predict correctly. It's a rational sense reflex, rational thinking reflex. People behave rationally in a situation when there is no choice, when there is no majority of uh, proponents of changes. Another bit, the Vitali. Uh, highlights that victory is impossible to be declared through pro propaganda. The victory must be real. It cannot be made believe. The opposition declaring victory must, must have this ring of truth to it. The opposition themselves must believe that this is the case. Well, it's, it's uh, not like when somebody is trying to put together some fiction and so to live in the make make believe world. I believe in 2006, uh, there were appeals. Let's just uh, predict. Let's just say that all the opinion polls, uh, they uh, testimony that the opposition is winning. And even if we lose, we will still say that we've, we've won. It's not gonna work. There must be some background. There must be some reality uh, behind this. Right. Uh, basically, Vitaly explains this. Take those electoral commissions. This is a colossal stratum, a, col col a colossal snapshot of uh, the society that replicate the societal change, the societal atmosphere. If the majority is against, uh, if the majority of population is against the regime, most likely the people in the electoral commissions uh, will be of the same mind. So falsifications, rigging the elections are technically feasible still. But uh, the effect, the long-term effect, uh, is uh, virtually impossible to overlook. It will be felt. And the third part, uh, mass street pressure, especially in the authoritarian format. Nothing's going to move without that. Street pressure is criticized poetically, politically, but uh, anyway, there's, there's, there's no way forward uh, without that. 
And it's also important to, to arrange that without the society believing that they've won and that they believe in the in, in their victory. What happened in 2020 did happen specifically because the proponents of changes uh, felt that they're in the majority. And then there, were, there, was, there, there was some reality behind that. There were facts behind that. We can definitely engage in debates whether the purely sociological uh, demonstration was the victory of the opposition. But nonetheless, there's, no, there's uh, not a shadow of doubt that the proponents of change, the advocates of change, and the, those who supported uh, Tikhanovsky as the president, uh, they were very many. Nearly 50%, most likely over 50% of the population. Anyway, it was colossal. It was immense. Uh, there's no victory in uh, of the sort that we would like to have. Well, we haven't uh, achieved that, but there is a process to get there. Nonetheless, the outcome was still unprecedented. It was unprecedented mobilization of the society, pro-democratic mobilization of the society. I would like to bring up the index. Pro-democratic pro pro -democratic versus pro-authoritarian mobilization, varieties for democracy. In 2020, this index of pro-democratic mobilization was uh, 399 out of four possible. So four, four points uh, is the maximum score. 399 is really unprecedented, this unprecedented uh, pro-democratic mobilization happened in the history of Belarus. And not just that, let me show you a different picture. It wasn't just true for Belarus. This is top 15 of the most prolonged pro-democratic mobilization in the, in the past 50 years. Again, the scale is uh, one through four. Belarus is, in, uh, is at the top. It's not just out of these 15 most wide-scale cases of pro-democratic mobilization. Belarus is actually is in the lead. It's, it's ranked one. It shares second place with Hong Kong, the first and second place. So the way we see it, or as we can see it, uh, this uh, mobilization in Belarus did not overthrow the regime. There are several factors that affect that affected that. But nonetheless, it's important to realize what has happened. It's a very important prerequisite for further process. And this happened uh, because of the electoral process. This happened because of the fact that indeed the majority of the population, a very significant part, possibly the majority of uh, the society, uh, they spoke for changes. They spoke for changes. It was not just an attempt to play for the social construct that we will create this reality in the propaganda terms that uh, this is, we are many and we are the majority. This was not the case. This was out of the communication with uh, among the people. Uh, it was very difficult to hide too. And there are some limits uh, of rigging. There are some limits where falsehood breaks down. It cannot. It cannot stand. And this, uh, these uh, points uh, could have been picked up from Vitaly's works of 10, 15 years and more ago. The things uh, that uh, help us better understand Belarusian reality uh, right now. Thank you very much. That would be it for my part. Thank you, Piotr. Indeed, uh, some very interesting charts. Uh, they have a very good demonstration to how we saw those ideas uh, implemented in reality. Uh, well, we would like uh, to discuss uh, the ideas of Vitaly in 2019, 2020. Uh, what uh, his ideas say about, what, they, what his ideas have, have to say about the current events, about the future events. 
say, he predicted uh, many events uh, that happened a decade after his death. Maybe there are more predictions in there. I see quite many people uh, in Zoom who worked alongside uh, Vitaly, who started from him, and who dis uh, discussed with him. Well, I believe that uh, people will have the opportunity to recall this experience of interaction with Vitaly. Please raise your hands. We'll have the opportunity to give you the floor, and we will give you a chance uh, to say a few good words about Vitaly, what, what, uh, what you remember about him, about his uh, legacy. So I would like to give the floor to our speakers once again, starting with uh, Mr. Andrew Wilson. Uh, can you please talk about uh, the concepts of Vitaly that you brought up, uh, how they apply to Belarusian events, if they do. Uh, Andrew, when you were preparing the second edition of your book, which uh, concepts of Vitaly helped you uh, put things in perspective for you? And what uh, uh, required some update for oh, this unprecedented Belarusian revolution? Uh, thanks again, Vadim. Um, well, that um, by 2020, the Belarusian regime was showing signs of age uh, and of not learning properly. And of uh, learning the wrong lessons. Maybe it was lucky in 2006, maybe we should assess this. You know, it was relatively successful. Uh, but in 2020, it was thinking in terms of the two previous elections, I guess. Um, firstly, there hadn't been much protest in 2015. But that was in very specific circumstances, only one year after um, the key, uh, the beginning of the war against Ukraine. Um, so the opposition, I guess, bought the stability argument briefly. Um, but he also drew the kind of wrong lesson from 2010. I think he probably genuinely expected um, a few days of harsh coercion would um, end protests. Um, but it was a much, much bigger genie to put back in, a, in, in the bottle this time. Um, because the protest didn't begin um, on election day. But they grew out of, firstly, the Sikhanovskaya campaign, um, which attracted unprecedented crowds, uh, and out of the um, authorities' failures over um, coronavirus. That because, because they'd failed, failed with their basic social contract, um, keeping the people safe, um, people turned to alternative sources of media for more reliable information and to help each other and to help health workers and uh, other frontline staff. Um, so you were already getting uh, civil society, if you like, knitting together. Uh, and then that, plus the protests, um, sorry, plus the campaign created the ground for the protests. I also think Lukashenko didn't really think enough about how the country had changed since the 2010 and 2015 elections, um, that although he was himself responsible for changing a lot and only really to preserve his own position, there were long term consequences to the different way that he played foreign policy games after the war against Ukraine. Um, diversification, sovereignization strategies, and various props to support that. Uh, 
a slightly more diverse economy so as to be less reliant on Russian subsidy, um, the growth of any private sector, uh, including the IT sector, and some limited liberalization, maybe, maybe that's the wrong word, loosening of political uh, controls enough to get sanctions lifted in uh, 16, in order to support that foreign policy diversification. So Belarus was a very different country in 2020 to what it had been in 2015, 2010, and certainly 1994. Um, so I think the metaphor that I, I finished with, I, I, I think Vitaly would have liked, he liked, he liked funny stories. You know, can an autocrat perform a 180 degree handbrake turn? You know, if he doesn't like what's happening, can he, can he put everything into reverse? Um, it's not necessarily that easy. I mean, obviously in autocracies, the decision that the autocrat makes are hugely important, but he has to operate within the context of all those social changes, foreign policy changes, etc. Um, and if we like, if, if you want a personal story, uh, Piotr will remember that the piece I wrote uh, for his website, I was talking about having a beer and watching football with Vitaly. Um, uh, in Prague, watching the European, sorry, the um, Champions League. Uh, and because I'm a Manchester United fan, I was talking about Manchester United and our previous victory. Uh, when Manchester United won, uh, the interviewer comes up to the Manchester United manager and puts the camera, uh, puts the microphone in front of him. And all he can say at the most important moment is, in his life is, Football, eh? <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> um, and I think Vitaly liked the fact that this incredibly successful guy could be human and inarticulate. Because um, he was human, um, usually very articulate too. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It is indeed an interesting part. We started from political constructs, from political science, uh, but uh, personal stories are a very good fit to the, to the occasion. Thank you very much. So, indeed, uh, Valeria has also mentioned some of that. Let's, let's continue that. I'll give the floor to Valeria. how Vitaly's concepts can be applied to 2020. Andrew has mentioned an important thing. The elections of 2015 happened in this atmosphere where it wasn't the actions of the government, but the external events uh, that precipitated the, the results that we saw. It was 10 years after the last elections that Vitaly saw. Basically, the next elections came in 2020. 2015 was the first election that happened without Vitaly around. So, Vitaly, uh, Valeria, how, how do you think? Uh, which concepts worked? Well, first of all, I would like to highlight two things, two important points. Well, first of all, it's the war of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, Vitaly did not see that one coming, and largely in his works, the fact of Russia, its uh, preparedness, actual preparedness to try to bring back its allies, I don't know, his, the, the zones of influence, uh, the, the zone of influence to bring it back with uh, military means. Well, to all of us, uh, to all of Europe, I mean, it was a shocking discovery. It was a shocking revelation that Russia can do that. Another shocking discovery came when Russia, despite the willingness and intention to do that, it, it, uh, it proved in, unable to do that, to bring it back, to, to bring Ukraine back. Well, these things uh, could not have been read in the concepts. Secondly, 
it's incorrect that it was uh, for external reasons that there were no, pro no protests in 2015. It's incorrect to say that. It is ideas of Vitaly Selitsky that brought, brought to uh, the part of the political circles believe that this pause, uh, this uh, sweep of the pendulum can be prolonged for some years uh, so that uh, the political, uh, the, the, the civil society can grow muscles and the people can be engaged in protests, uh, can be, people uh, can bring changes in a protest freeway. The protests uh, only caused uh, reprisals, repressions. Uh, it was also causing purges in the political setting, in the social uh, surrounding. And after each electoral cycle, they had to rebuild uh, the something that was destroyed. The elections of 2015 helped well, help just carry on. It's uh, not true saying that we need to build from scratch, we had to build from scratch. Uh, there, there is a third factor that couldn't have been uh, identified, couldn't have been picked up when Vitaly was actively researching, was the factor of the diaspora that Rigor mentioned. And I believe this factor to be very important. The times have changed. Uh, moving abroad is very different than 15, 20 years ago. The engagement of the diaspora in the politics uh, did play a huge role in 2020 as well. And I believe that the engagement of the di diasporas will be active. Uh, uh, it will be uh, or political migration in, a, in, in very, in, in many ways, it's it, it said that there was no genuine opposition in the country left, so that there is nothing you can expect from them. And we should also say that I believe that these approaches are changing, and this uh, Svetlana's journey to many countries, it shows that the role of the diaspora can grow in, even more in a way that the inf information picture will be created inside the countries they, where they live. They can push Belarusian agenda in the countries where they live right now. And it will be also stronger interaction with the Belarusian civic society. I would also wish uh, to bring up uh, some predictions Again, if we were to proceed from the thoughts and points, concepts of Vitaly, how I perceive them, how I interpret them. But we need to take these three factors into, into account. Russia's preparedness to, to uh, violence, including military intervention, that's the first bit. This prolonged pause of the, of the pendulum swinging, yes, it did give some results, it did give some outcomes, we've, we've seen them. However, on the other hand, the scale of the reprisals was completely was completely unknown. It's uh, not clear whether this pause is, is relevant, is needed right now. So many years on, it's, it's difficult to assess. At least uh, this process is not complete. The experience of that pause, the experience of that break is, is not really obvious. And the second role, globalization, the role of the diaspora in the globalization as, as we know it, uh, how it evolved. Right. Vitaly always proceeded from the basic equation of the societal development and of the regime development and of some search between the balance on the part of the society and the regime to try to keep the balance uh, and or to move forward. He proceeded from the fact that this is the starting point, this is where you start pushing forward. And right now we see that the authorities, uh, until, I don't know, uh, two, three, four weeks back, they've been trying to uh, get the society balanced or imbalanced with their uh, mindset. They just tried to get rid of everyone who was disrupting the balance. It's highly paid experts. Basically, they promoted migration of highly skilled experts, they forced them to leave the country. 
let alone the opposition, the civil activists uh, that comes without saying. And largely, they acted in such a way that the development of the country, including the social, uh, including the economic development, I mean, they wanted to bring it back, to, to revert to the, to the status ante. They wanted to bring it back where they felt more or less comfortable, more, more or less confident. But I would like to say that these measures uh, required, this measure demanded uh, new resources. Uh, they did not have any endogenous resources, any own resources. They came to Russia for those, uh, including the information resources. We see that the current Belarusian propaganda is indeed the Russian propaganda. There's nothing in it to resemble what it used to be like until 2020. The points, the matter, everything changed. It, it completely changed. And financially, uh, the violent resources, uh, well, they, they were borrowed and they're still borrowed. They're still being borrowed. And in this case, in this situation, well, I personally, I don't believe this. I don't know what Vitaly would have said about this, but I, I think he would have, would have agreed with me. I don't think it, it's possible to bring the society back to bring the society's de societal development uh, to 15 years back, to 2005, 2006. I don't think it's possible. Even using Russia uh, as a source of pressure, Russian leverage. A very interesting point by Andrew Wilson about the interaction of Belarusian opposition uh, with the Russian one. It's not maybe uh, solely about their interaction, although, yeah, it, it must have played a role. It must be must have been possible. There is coordination as well. Uh, the Russian opposition is borrowing Belarusian examples. It's it's obvious in many cases. It, sh it shines right through in many cases. I would also like to say that in Russia as well, the disruption between the societal development and the uh, regime's development, uh, this discrepancy, the difference, the divide is growing a bit less. Uh, now, in their case, uh, their, their system is more sophisticated than ours. And this preemptive nature uh, is running uh, across multiple dimensions at once, including active borrowing of uh, foreign practices. Russian propaganda is significantly more successful than the previous Belarusian iteration of propaganda, simply because it's borrowing very well the Western in informational technologies. Right, what am I getting at? Uh, there are serious changes, profound political changes happening in Russia, in Russia, and I believe that uh, the Belarusian society, the civil society in Belarus, are supposed to, and they can, coordinate uh, with the course of the Russian political process, uh, uh, well, possibly in in autumn, in, in the fall, in, in midsummer, there will be protests in Russia, despite uh, the complete reluctance of the Russian opposition to uh, force uh, a, a confrontation, a face-off with the regime. They also want to, 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 to get some break or something. Is Vitaly my... Take into account, uh, as uh, Vitaly would have said, uh, from my, po my personal point of view, my personal perspective, I presume that it is impossible to reverse back or to achieve, how to say, some overwhelming democratic victory, even if the regime is changed, the regime is replaced. But uh, we might say that regime is different, even though it's Lukashenko and the same people around him. So these people act in a different way. They change interaction. They change institutions. Change. One has to uh, observe carefully and look for opportunities. That's what, what I'm going to say. That's what I'm going to finish with. Thank you very much indeed, Valeria. Indeed, the regime is changing from inside, and it's not according to the rules. So, international events. It would be appropriate to say that Belarus uh, did not 
border. Well, actually, we, we did not uh, sit doing nothing. So the opposition in 2015, we have been choosing different approaches uh, compared to 1996, 2006. But if you, if you would be able to add complement, what is uh, what Vitaly would have said, would have acted in a way in the current reality. If you have any, everything to add, you're welcome. Say in 2021, what are the elements and moments and aspects would have been interesting to Vitaly? Thank you very much indeed. Well, I have been thinking. Uh, so I wanted to uh, say something reasonable, as people would like to hear. Well, well, generally speaking, I've uh, said a, lo a lot uh, during the first in intervention. Uh, probably would would not agree to to 100% what Elena stated. Uh, so the uh, authoritarian international, the authoritarian regimes united probably interdependency with uh, other authoritarian regimes. And then generally speaking, if we look at it, uh, what uh, is supporting Lukashenko? So they are coming from the authoritarian system as well. So their in interest in supporting the system is not exactly uh, strong per se, because we understand Russia is hoping is supporting him because he is the person that they, they don't like very much, but he is uh, uh, conforming to the Russian interests. So if we look at China, if, for example, China is going to support Alexander Lukashenko, whether this is corresponding to the, the interests of Chinese. Well, actually, it's not. If, if the events and activities that are taking place, uh, say they're uh, going cargo through Belarus, say the, the Grand Stone, that is active, so the perspectives are worsening of its development. So there have been logic behind taking decisions so that uh, the system has to be supporting itself and, and we need to take a look at international activity of Alexander Lukashenko. So the first visit to Azerbaijan is as well an authoritarian country where kind of uh, friendly relations with the local ruler. Probably they have similar approaches to policy, to politics. So it's not the first uh, visit of him. We uh, looked at uh, Erdogan. So that kind of support of the, uh, on the part of the authoritarian international. So we have been uh, listening to the joint statements. NATO was uh, making a statement to a certain extent uh, adjusted the phrase. So the position of Turkey. So we see that authoritarian systems uh, support one another to a certain extent. So that not to uh, inflict harm or damage because they, they feel insecure if there would be uh, critical changes or drastic changes occurring. So I believe that uh, information about Hungary is available. So whether this is uh, uh, so acceptable for them to um, in, introduce uh, sanctions against Belarus. So we see that in general, authoritarian regime uh, and the international exist, and we have to be aware that to a certain extent they would be supporting one another because there is a perception, there's understanding. It's not the, the situation, it's not a trend. So therefore, they would be uh, supporting each other, uh, assisting each other, learning from one another. And unfortunately, this would uh, take place and uh, be preserved for a certain period of time. Thank you, Rihor. You stated that there's a current trend. There's uh, spring, and then the authoritarian international was uh, active. So the Arabian Spring, where uh, not cared about, were not reacted on. And so that revolutions, to a certain extent, uh, some lessons have been learned from, and so probably if you don't support uh, the situation in Belarus, you may uh, get a similar situation in your own way, in your own country. 
so that some players have to be careful because you mentioned that the role of diaspora is undergoing changes. And it seems to be that uh, we should have mentioned that uh, a very well-known fact, so that taxes changed, so that the person was well-known, it was possible to uh, look at te Telegram, it was impossible to use Zoom. So to say 2006, it was impossible even to think about. And so it's introducing uh, digital technologies. So the uh, limitations of coronavirus affected. And uh, generally, uh, this, even physical location is uh, changed. So the di diaspora role is also growing. Financial uh, contribution of diaspora, uh, say, in the pre-election campaign, said the during elections and after. So probably it's possible because the appropriately applying uh, the technologies of uh, challenging the resources and funds. So it's very common, very... In 2006, it was absolutely impossible to, to think of. However, I see that I wanted to say and would like to give the floor to the speaker. So, Alena, your turn, because Rehor was uh, able to criticize to a certain extent what you've said. Well, I would like to continue the technology that we touched, but from, to a certain extent, different perspective from the point of view of uh, learning, training that we have been already discussing. First of all, this is a contradiction. Well, it is interesting to look at the regime of Lukashenko. It's not uh, ahead of the situations and developments and then uh, perception of what is going on. But the regime of Lukashenko is learning not only on international practice of authoritarian regimes, but from the situation and developments taking place in the country. It seems to me that it's not a good uh, pupil, a student. We have been mentioning a number of times during discussion that he failed to uh, pre predict the use and development and introduction technologies, t t Telegram, involvement of uh, uh, diaspora fundraising companies, and he failed to see the break uh, between uh, the gap between the society and civil society and regime so that his regime is safe. Is safe. We need to mention that Belarusian regime is not the most advanced using technologies and using the uh, recent developments in the IT world. From the point of view of uh, uh, learning, Lukashenko is failing to learn from China. One thing is question whether he's learning or not, or if there are any resources in Belarus uh, the supporting the system for technologically developed uh, uh, regime like uh, monitoring social media or uh, image recollection as they introduced in, in China. So there were attempts to, to promote this in Belarus, but Belarusian system from the very beginning, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's not uh, ahead or it's not prevention that Lukashenko is trying to make of, use of. It's the situation when the regime wants to keep uh, the current situation, the status quo, but there would be a lot of work, a lot of activities needed to improve social context, to modernize regime from the point of view of economy and technology. However, the fact that the regime is not a good learner, a good student, is good for, for civil society of Belarus from the point of view that technologies are being used by civil society in a more successful manner and more efficiently. Thanks very much indeed. I like the thesis. So to uh, stay, to keep the status quo, you need to change a lot. I like this very much. If you look at the reaction of the Belarusian authorities at certain developments, if these uh, developments are not related to political sphere, it's like actions of authorities. It's nothing happened, nothing changed. It's uh, everything is expected, everything is planned, is scheduled, nothing terrible. It seems to me that uh, uh, something terrible happens, that this was also part of our plan. They would be the response of authorities. 
I'd like to give uh, the floor to Piotr. He is with us, probably to uh, complete the block of speakers. To ideas of Vitaly in current years and in relation to forecasts that uh, what could you say in addition well I would keep my promise Vitaly was writing about three scenarios of uh, situation and transformation and developments in Belarus first scenario is the breakthrough that is uh, transferred to democracy either through uh, elections or mass mobilization. It's least possible, least uh, uh, realistic scenario uh, as was presented by Vitaly 15 years ago. And unfortunately in, in 2021, we need to admit. So this was least realistic. So it's least probable. Then second, transformation of personal dictatorship to competitive autocracy. Similarly to Russian or Ukrainian origin, but he has been referring to Kuchma time in Ukraine. Say the Kuchma origin, transformation of regime and then influence of the outer factors. First of all, Russian factor. And the third scenario, third option is uh, or was the pre prerequisites for democracy, but without democracy. That is, the society, the community is ripening with desire, with readiness to democratic changes. However, democracy is being curbed, is uh, not coming in, is not active. And uh, further social revolution as of changes in the society, in economics, would require deeper prerequisites, sharpening of the desire, aggravation of the situation. However, existing political balance of the forces uh, for the benefit of the regime, from the point of view, due to the weakness or lack of systemic approach on the part of opposition, and then and elimination of political components and using repri reprisals and appropriate apparatus of the authorities. These two options, latter options, 15 years ago, have been evaluated as most likely by Vitaly. Well, in the future, for the future, this would be an, an alternative, but you will have to adjust a, a certain, say, Probably the, the strength of this statement, the first option uh, transfer to democracy is uh, more likely to happen compared to 15 years ago, because Vitaly was very, very carefully mentioning this, saying it's close to impossible. Now I wouldn't be that, uh, say, uh, dramatic or they wouldn't be that pessimistic. So this, unfortunately, this scenario is less probable. Two other options, two other scenarios, transformation of authoritarianism to competitive authoritarianism, or the third option or the third version, the third variant. So the, the force would be used to uh, keep the regime, uh, rigid uh, regime alive, aloft, afloat, So if we look at the third option, the third variant, so it's uh, see the, uh, say the sad, but the most likely. So Vitaly has been paying attention to such aspects like this kind of situation for regime is far from being comfortable for regime itself. It's uh, full of risks because it's also strengthening with the explosion of social uh, conflict. It, it might mean uh, increased risks of loss, certain uh, resources for the regime. So that uh, might be something uh, coming out of control and then blood might be shed and there would be victims from all sides. 
So therefore, Vitaly has been saying that most likely in parallel with suppression, the protests intentions, the protests uh, movement, they would be trying to carry out constitutional reform. That is exactly what we are looking at and uh, witnessing. That is to transfer Belarus from hegemonic authoritarianism to more competitive authoritarianism through widening powers of uh, parliament, local authorities. So Lukashenko was mentioning this kind of stuff a couple of times. However, the regime decided to carry out whether this is would be persistent, but they, they believe that they would not be expanding the powers of the parliament so that the local authorities and local self-governing bodies would not acquire more powers or say there would be all Belarusian uh, meeting. There would be uh, no transparency or almost no transparency. So there would be a, a palescent, a puck. When we speak about the election process, well, this kind of scenario from the one hand would be possible to use to stabilize the situation of the regime, keep the uh, satisfaction of Lukashenko to his greed to power, he would be the more structured position. So what kind of reforms are needed that would turn into likelihood that the opposition would be strengthening. So the opposition is not in a classical way. So that adherence of changes, it could be in any place, in any spot, as it happened in 2020. It could happen anywhere and anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So we looked at even in a situation where it's close to impossible for the uh, uh, for the benefit of the democracy, mentioning about the old Belarusian meeting. But we also mentioned that Vitaly was uh, evaluating the new uh, risks. I would like to address the uh, participants of the meeting. So that there are a number of people who have been personally uh, familiar and knew Vitaly on a closer basis. Probably you might be able to share something. So we also, this person has been writing history, story about meeting Vitaly. So I understand that there's a, there are people who have been participating in educational training programs with Vitaly. So if anyone would like to take the floor, add, compliment, elaborate, say something about Vitaly. So Anton, do you see uh, hands raised or someone would like to take the floor? and uh, voice and express himself or herself. Anton? Well, for the time being, I don't see anyone. Well, we may uh, continue discussion or we may wind up because I don't see among the participants. However, in the course of registration, the person, a mother of Vitaly Silitsky, Hanna Silitsky. I don't see her among participants. If uh, she is with us, we would like to give the floor. If not, then we might be winding up if no one would uh, be happy to take the floor. So, I would urge anyone who knew Vitaly personally to share uh, the re recollections. Or some of the of the speakers might be able to add a compliment. We might hear the, the story about
Можливо, з білоруської треба перейти тому, що на русський, а на іс, якщо так, може бути проще. If you can hear me, so I'll be switching from Belarusian into Russian. If someone would be happy to take the floor, we either continue. So I would probably compliment and say something in addition. Well, it happened in 2007 or 2008. So I was part of the Dominique Monastery in Vilnius. And Vitaly, I can remember the colleague, they have been visiting me, we have been chatting, we, and I wanted to offer uh, Riga made balsam to Vitaly. I liked it very much. So I was adding it to the tea and I was pu pushing the cup of tea to Vitaly. Say, look, uh, Enjoy the tea. So he said, do, do you have a, a glass? So he asked for a, for, for a glass. So he poured, he poured the glass and then he poured, poured balsam. He consumed very quickly. And since then I started consuming balsam of Riga in, in small glasses and it tastes very nice. I have to confirm. Well, a nice, nice story. So it sh shows that Vitaly has been multifaceted person uh, with, with many talents. And then also you have been depicting your, your story of Vitaly having a glass of Riga balsam. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I, I, I was happy to, to, to hear all of you, and, and, and um, I, I remember very well uh, Vitaly Silitsky. He's among the ones who took me into all these Belarusian studies. And just to, to as a reminder, it, he, we invited him and Piotr Marcev, another one who left much too early. And he joined uh, with other experts. There was um, Alexei Pikulik, uh, there was um, Almira Vusmanova. I mean, great people who came in May 2009. So that was already <laughs> so many years ago to, to Helsinki where I organized a, a, a symposium and where I met the, uh, um, also Arkady Moshes who, whom we invited and who then later became my boss. <clears throat> but it was then, <clears throat> sorry, only at the University of, of, of Helsinki. And yeah, I will not tell all the details about the balsam and other things we drank there, but you, you knew Marcev as well. And, and uh, it, was, it was really great fun. And it was almost already the Bieli Nochi in, in Helsinki. And um, yeah, it was very great, great memories that I wanted to share with you. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Anais. Literally, in any, in any place, it's nice to have good time. So there's tra tradition to... Uh, probably you, Valeria, might be able to share a story of, of, your, of yours, uh, of Vitaly. Well, I'll tell you what. I have been communicating for quite a while with him. We have been working together. In many things we have been similar approaches and then however the largest the, the strongest trace was the story of his uh, passing away so it has shown his uh, approach to life and solving problems so he has been struggling, has been uh, fighting, and he has been intending to get appropriate assistance. And by the way, I don't know whether this uh, has been happening before, but there was solidarity in payment of the appropriate uh, treatment that was impossible uh, here. But then it was clear 
that the struggle was lost. I don't know whether you are aware, but he was a lonely person. He, he was not married, he, were, he didn't have a, a traditional family like this. At the same time, he has a large uh, number of friends, huge number, considerable number of friends. So this kind of uh, assistance was needed. It's impossible to make it on your own. And the circle of friends of Vitali, friends have been visiting him. People were taking duties, people were... So in fact, he was not alone. And this kind of support was rendered. It's not because we are like this, but he was an open person like this. So I haven't seen of a similar approach or similar character like this. He was very touching. And I want whether this is possible to mention to the person that was passing away. Uh, this person was inspiring, inspiring others. Well, indeed, from the one hand, uh, this kind of situation is a, is a difficult one. Yeah, but when, when the per person is passing away in the circle uh, or encircled by good friends, probably it's the uh, kind of situation, kind of uh, uh, situation that, that people would be thinking, would be dreaming about kind of scenario of your last minutes. So logic... Logically speaking, we have been looking at considering some concepts and we ended up with uh, uh, recollecting funny moments of uh, Vitaly's life. Probably it's exactly the time and the moment where we need to wind up. I'm very grateful to everyone who was uh, together with us, who took part in this discussion. I'm very glad that we all have been recollecting and... Uh, Mr. Selitsky, and then a nice number of people who took part in it. Probably, it's my personal point of view, it's a quality sign of a person who has been training uh, others to do and has who's been uh, leaving a lot of results of his activities. Very good uh, recollections, very good concepts, books, uh, and even the uh, stipend or grant that is named after him. And indeed, this uh, allows us to believe that his heritage would be preserved. And we need to do everything we could so that Vitaly Silitsky and his ideas are preserved, kept, and further developed in Belarus and this current discussion, current meeting was a kind of contribution to it. Thanks very much indeed to everybody. So we will be winding up and we would keep recollecting Vitaly Silitsky. Thanks very much indeed. And uh, see you at the later stage. See you during next meetings.